I would like to take this time to acknowledge the perfusion students of the Texas Heart Institute of Cardiovascular Perfusion Program, and especially like to thank Debbie Adams, Program Director, for the invitation to speak. I've always been particularly interested in research of the brain and cerebral blood flow, and now that ECMO has become a regular, regular part of the perfusion life, I think it is important to understand its relationship to neurologic injury. Extracorporeal life, uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation may be a life-saving treatment for patients with severe refractory lung and or heart failure when conventional intensive care fails. However, in addition to the critical condition of the patient, ECMO treatment itself is associated with significant morbidity and mortality. And as you can see from this pic, the neurological complications are among the leading causes of death and disability in ECMO patients. Uh, this insult here is a result of a middle cerebral infarct. This is a brief outline of what I'd like to cover in the next 20 minutes. So uh, cerebral blood flow and cardiopulmonary bypass, talking about altered collateral blood flow regulation of cerebral blood flow, neurologic injury, infarct and hemorrhage, uh, alterations in hemostasis, brain injury and in VV versus VA, the ECMO circuit itself, and of course, CO2. In 1959, uh, the closest parallel that can be drawn for insight into autoregulation during ECMO is from cardiopulmonary bypass. Loss of cerebral autoregulation can result in ischemia or edema and hemorrhage, even with slight changes in cerebral perfusion pressure. You can see from this classic Lawson curve uh, that was reported in 1959 and debated and then uh, brought back again as sort of a key standard. Uh, the Lawson curve depicts autoregulation of cerebral blood flow over a range of cerebral perfusion pressures. Point A is the lower limit of the curve after which the decrease in cerebral perfusion pressure will lead to reductions in cerebral blood flow. Point B is the higher limit of the curve at which an increase in cerebral perfusion pressure will increase cerebral blood flow. And the range of cerebral perfusion pressure depicted by X is the zone of autoregulation where the cerebral blood flow remains constant over changes in cerebral perfusion pressure. And it is regulated by vasoconstriction and vasotilidation of cerebral arterioles. In 1995, Dr. Arthur Schwartz from New York Presbyterian Hospital, an anesthesiologist, wrote this paper entitled Cerebral Blood Flow is Determined by Arterial Pressure and Not Cardiopulmonary Bypass Flow Rate. Global hypoperfusion of the brain during cardiopulmonary bypass leads to ischemic insult and neurologic injury. Cerebral ischemia depends on collateral circulation. They did independent manipulations of arterial blood pressure and pump flow measured during cardiopulmonary bypass procedures. And their findings were that cerebral blood flow was greater at high blood pressure than low pressure during bypass, an alteration of pump flow rate produced no changes in cerebral blood flow. So they concluded that cerebral blood flow during cardiopulmonary bypass is regulated by the arterial blood pressure and not pump flow rate. And then in 1994, this original article, Current Perfusion Techniques for Repair of Giant Cerebral Aneurysms, was something that we uh, created this circuit for clipping of these giant cerebral aneurysms that were uh, unable to be clipped under the conventional method. Femoral cannulation was used, a closed chest approach was used, and the patient was cooled to a brain temperature of 16 to 18 before circulatory arrest. During arrest, blood is then drained into the venous and cardiotomy reservoirs enabling us to shrink the cerebral vessels and aneurysm for direct bloodless surgical repair under, under the neurosurgical microscope. In 1996, Dr. Schwartz wrote another paper uh, using a baboon model 
and the right common carot carotid artery and the ipsilateral femoral cannulated and joined to a centrifugal pump. Closed circuit system uh, blood was withdrawn from the femoral artery, cooled and reinfused into the right common carotid with the external branches occluded. The pump flow was regulated to keep the, the right common carotid pressure equal to the systemic blood pressure. The cerebral temperature was decreased to less than 25 degrees for three hours. The results were that global brain hypothermia resulted from profound altered collateral cerebral circulation during artificial hypothermic perfusion. Cerebral autoregulation is the ability of the brain to maintain relatively constant blood flow despite changes in perfusion pressure. On cardiopulmonary bypass, it, it's very similar to VA ECMO, and a comparison may be drawn for similar changes in cerebral and systemic chemodynamics leading to changes in cerebral blood flow and autoregulation. There's a lot more data in the pediatric literature for cerebral blood flow changes on ECMO uh, than there is for adults. So more studies are needed to assess cerebral blood flow change in adults. You can see here from the ELSA registry, this is a graph of the annual respiratory adult runs, which happen to be the smallest but most growing population of ECMO patients. This is through 2020. Also from ELSO, depicting neurological injury ranges, we see that there are subtle neurocognitive deficits, including intracranial hemorrhage, seizure, ischemic stroke, and brain death. And this injury may be sustained pre-ECLS, during ECLS, or post-ECLS. And you can see from the registry in the year of 2020, a total of 7,161 runs reported. Of that, 51% survived, but 49% had mortality. Now there are, are about five randomized controlled trials that have been reported uh, for the use of ECMO. I'm just gonna talk about four here, uh, and just to review this evidence, and you can see that the first paper in 1979 was ZAPOL, and ECMO can support gas exchange, but does not increase long-term survival, was reported. Then the second paper is the Morris paper. It looked at CO2 removal only. And then finally, you see the CSER and the EOLIA trial. In, in the CSER trial, Peak studied mechanical ventilation as VA or VV ECMO at a single center. And Elaine Coombs found no statistical difference in mortality at 60 day compared to mechanical ventilation. But what is of note here is there, there were, none of these trials measured neurologic outcome. You can see from the CSER trial, the exclusion criteria prior to entry was mechanical ventilation greater than seven days intracranial bleeding, any other contraindication to limited heparinization for patients who were moribund. So no neuropatient was involved. And the same in the EOLIA trial. Moribund condition, uh, according to a SAPS-2 uh, score, current non-drug-induced coma after cardiac arrest, irreversible neurologic injury, and decisions to withhold or withdraw life-sustaining therapies. All these patients were not included. You look at the factors affecting cerebral blood flow on VV ECMO versus VA, you can see that abrupt O2 and CO2 changes during initiation can result in constriction or dilation, producing a reduction in sympathetic nerve activity that may lead to brain injury. And incidentally, cerebral blood flow changes 4% for for each millimeter of mercury change in, in CO2. On VA ECMO, outflow cannulation sites in the femoral artery flows into the descending aorta and can result in limb ischemia. Also retrograde flow creates afterload on the left ventricle causing distension, reduced coronary blood flow or pulmonary edema or hypoxemia. And then we always have the opportunity once the heart begins to beat again a dual circulation, which provides deoxygenated blood to the head vessels. 
This paper is a retrospective analysis of, of the ELSO database. It's the LaRusso paper utilizing 6,834 patients and they compare dual lumen and single lumen cannulas for BV ECMO. Dual lumen cannulas are larger with potential to increase cerebral venous congestion, and that could be a problem. So their hypothesis was, is the dual lumen in VV associated with higher rates of neurologic injury? The dual cannulation has several potential advantages over traditional cannulation, which is why many uh, physicians choose to use it including easier ambulation and reduced recirculation. The occurrence of neurological complications in this study was not related to the type of cannulation in patients undergoing VV ECMO. And as you can see from the chart on the right-hand corner, intracerebral hemorrhage, a, a, acute ischemic stroke, seizure, and brain, brain death were nearly the same in both groups. Now we move to 2018, where we talk about neurological events are frequent in VA ECMO treated patients. Ischemic stroke is the most frequent in this particular paper after one week on ECMO support. Had no specific risk, risk factor and is not associated with high, higher mortality. Intracranial bleeding occurred earlier and is associated with female sex, central VA ECMO, low platelet count and rapid CO2 change at ECMO start and high mortality. And you can see the common theme here in most of these papers is changes in CO2. This paper also was a comparison of peripheral VA ECMO versus central VA, VA cannulation. Here we see 275 patients, 15 of whom developed a brain uh, injury. The, uh, this is higher than a 1.7 to 8% incidence reported on other studies and may be explained by, our, by their generous CT examination policy. 37% of the lesions were diagnosed from a CT scan performed in the absence of neurologic symptoms. VA ECMO showed sole independent risk association uh, with brain injury development. Pre ECMO, cardiac arrest, and conversion between ECMO modalities, conversions from VV to VA car carried a relative risk uh, for development of injury at 7.6, while the relative risk for conversion from VA to VV was 0.66. And if you remember the relative risk or risk, risk ratio is the ratio of probability of an outcome in an exposed group to the probability of an outcome in an unexposed group. Further explanations on VA ECMO, blood is returned directly to the arteries without the lungs as a filter. So thrombi from the ECMO circuit may reach the cerebral circulation. Loss of natural pulsatile flow seen on VA ECMO may also affect cerebral vessels, leading to hyper or hypo reactivity, which has been suggested to increase the risk for neurologic injury. And then again, we have differential hypoxemia or hypoperfusion to the cerebral vessels. Patients who suffered from uh, brain injury had higher uh, APTT at ECMO initiation. The limitations to this study uh, was that the retros it was retrospective and had its inherent uh, limitations. 37% of the patients diagnosed with a brain infarct did not show any neurologic symptoms and the clinical significance predicting these infarcts could be debated. In this paper, the frequency of neurologic events shown on VV ECMO uh, are stated as un relatively unknown. The study found 135 consecutive VV patients, 7.5% had cerebral bleeding, 2% ischemic stroke, and 19% experienced some kind of neurologic event. Intracranial bleed was independently associated with renal failure. And again, we see PaCO2 decrease at ECMO initiation was also associated with brain injury. Hemostasis disorders were not associated with intracranial bleed. Whereas in this paper, talking about ischemic and hemorrhagic brain injury during VA ECMO, 
its multifactorial process with multiple vents may injure the brain and vessels leading to bleeding and hemostasis disorders before and at the start uh, of ECMO and rapid CO2 changes being among them. This, this author recommends to keep a platelet count above 100,000 during VA ECMO insertion and to infuse low dose heparin unless the patient's uh, profusely bleeding to avoid circuit clotting that may injure uh, and may, may induce uh, it, itself thrombocytopenia. Here you can see regulation of cerebral auto, auto regulation by carbon dioxide. Because of the rapid decrease in CO2 leading to vasoconstriction, the relationship between PaCO2 change and cerebral bleeding is difficult to understand. You can see you have maximum dilation at point A and maximal constriction at point C. Now we have to just briefly touch on disorders of the ECMO circuit. Initiation of ECMO is similar to systemic inflammatory response syndrome. First, we have contact activation and coagulation and inflammatory cascades begin to activate and cytokines rise rapidly. Then we have complement and contact activation producing leukocyte activation. All can lead to endothelial injury, disrupted microcirculation and end organ function. Many studies have discussed SIRS during cardiopulmonary bypass, but le less work has been done for ECMO. So some future research there. And then in addition, hemolysis, thrombocytopenia, fibrinolysis, and acquired von Willebrand syndrome uh, were found to be the same in VA and VV ECMO. There have been several successful case reports of VV and VA ECMO treatment without systemic anticoagulation in hemorrhagic patients. Other studies have looked at ACT levels at 180 to 220 versus 140 to 160 and reported no difference in oxygenator clotting. Subcutaneous anoxaprin was used for another study of 61 patients and no uh, intracerebral hemorrhage or clotted oxygenators was found. In the HELP ECMO study by, by McQuilton, Normal versus low dose heparin, decreasing PTT and anti 10A levels showed no difference in thromboembotic uh, or bleeding events. ECMO causes platelet dysfunction, so it should be monitored during ECMO if possible. Consider using platelet aggregometry uh, or TAG. Uh, the platelet aggregation blood test checks how well platelets. Uh, in part clumped together and cause blood to clot. One of the important things that we need to think about uh, during ECMO that is accomplished in some institution and then not others, uh, using a nears, uh, near infrared spectrom spectroscopy measures regional cerebral oxygen saturation. It's also used now uh, on the limb, on the leg that is femorally cannulated, either on the calf or the thigh to test for uh, regional oxygenation there, uh, possibly um, showing the clinician um, the need for using a, uh, an additional cannula to provide circulation to the lower limb. Imaging preferred cranial com computed tomography in, in the paper by uh, Marika, 37% of those patients who underwent cranial CT scan during ECMO were found to have either intracranial hemorrhage, ischemic stroke, or generalized edema. Somatosensory sens evoked potentials are used mainly in, um, right now I have never seen them used in ECMO, but in, um, in in cranial surgery. The cortical generators of the N2 component are located in the territory of the middle cerebral artery. And various studies have correlated decreases in N2 and N20 amplitude by more than 50% with cerebral hypoperfusion. EEG, the presence of EEG background abnormality and certain electro Graphic patterns can aid in the prediction of neurologic outcome after ECMO support. 
And then there are lab results, uh, biomarkers as predictors of neuronal injury. So for glial activation, the S100B protein and adhesion molecules measuring the ICAM-5. So just to recap, there's a lot of information. Hopefully um, I've sparked your imagination somewhat to what's happening on ECMO and neuroinjury. Uh, cerebral blood flow is necessary to maintain autoregulation. Consider monitoring during the ECMO run. Altered collateral blood flow we talked about, cannulation techniques and venous congestion is something that needs to be considered uh, as the physician is cannulating the patient, choosing the right size cannula, placing it in the correct location. Neurologic injury can occur at any time during the ECMO run. Brain infarction, intracranial hemorrhage, both occur on VV and VA ECMO. And alterations in hemostasis. hemostasis. So we need to consider circuit components. We need to keep our, our, our circuits simple. The more you add to the circuit, the more opportunity you have for clotting in different areas of the circuit. And then monitoring, possibly CT, EEG, NIRS, uh, evoke potentials and lab tests may alert clinicians to evolving brain injuries during ECMO. And again, CO2, avoid large fluctuations upon initiation and during ECMO. And in summary, intracerebral hemorrhage, ischemic stroke, seizure, cerebral edema, intracranial hypertension, global cerebral hypoxia and anoxia, and brain death seem to be the most common neurological injury on ECMO. They may result prior to initiation of ECMO, during, or post ECMO. And failure of ECMO to provide adequate oxygen delivery or abrupt changes in CO2 levels can cause neuroinjury. Early diagnosis and intervention are crucial to limit morbidity and mortality from neurologic injury during ECMO. Thank you for your time.